Good evening and welcome to Debate Minnesota's uh, Voter ID Constitutional Amendment Debate. I'm Bill Salisbury, a political reporter for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, and I will be your moderator tonight. And thank you all for being here. In 2004, a man named Will Hadland founded Debate Minnesota. He was a friend and colleague of mine and a true student of political history. Will and the people uh, he asked to serve on the Debate Minnesota board were from different backgrounds and political persuasions, but they all shared a concern about the impact of negative advertising and money in politics and the lack of civility in our political discourse. Debate Minnesota proposes that we take a lesson from Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas and carry our issues back to the public square where the real power lies in this nation with the people. And as with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, we believe that the best way to restore civility in the election process is through content-rich discussions. I propose that we dedicate tonight's debate to Will Havland, who died last week, as a way of honoring the noble mission he envisioned. (laughs) On November 6, Minnesota voters will decide whether to switch from having no voter identification requirement to adopting one of the strictest ID laws in the nation. As retired Judge Jack Davies wrote in a Star Tribune opinion piece on Wednesday, voting on a constitutional amendment isn't like choosing between candidates for a two or four or six year term. It's adopting state policy that is likely to last for generations. Jack wrote, constitution making is serious business. Here to debate the proposed voter ID amendment tonight Our proponent, Dan McGrath, the executive director of Minnesota Majority, who is speaking on behalf of the organization Protect My Vote, and opponent, Doran Schratz, executive director of the Isaiah Project, speaking for the group Our Vote, Our Future. Uh, We will begin the debate with two-minute opening statements. Uh, Then I will ask questions, and and, uh, the the debaters will have uh, two minutes to answer each question, followed by one up follow-up, one minute follow-ups. Um, we uh, had a coin toss before uh, we came in tonight, and Ms. Schranz won the coin toss, um, so she will start. Um, we will rotate the questions throughout the night, and finally, at the end, each candidate will have a chance to make a two-minute uh, closing statement. Before we start, I want to thank our student timekeepers here in front uh, tonight for helping us, helping keep us on schedule and on track. And I want to ask the members of the audience, uh, please do not cheer, jeer, or applaud until, we, until the conclusion of tonight's debate. So, uh, Ms. Schrantz, would you give the first thank opening you. statement, please? Thank you. At first, the voter restriction amendment might look like common sense reform. But the more Minnesotans really look under the hood of this ill-conceived amendment, we see that it's actually an extreme makeover of our election system. If this amendment passes, it's going to do three things. One, it's going to cost Minnesotans a lot. Two, it will create a complex two-tiered voting system and make absentee voting and election day registration difficult, if not impossible. And three, it will have serious unintended consequences of potentially locking out hundreds of thousands of eligible voters, including seniors and active duty military. First, it will impose another unfunded mandate on our already strapped local governments. Nonpartisan officials from Minnesota have estimated that it may cost up to $150 million to implement, meaning we are going to pay for it out of higher property taxes when we are not paying for it out of our own pocket. And while the proponents of photo ID say that IDs are free, we all know that in government there is no such thing as free. Second, it will cost so much because it's so complicated. The amendment creates a complex two-tiered voting system that we have never seen before. It also eliminates same-day registration as we know it and places huge hurdles in the way of absentee voting. (coughs) Third, it fails to safeguard the rights of thousands of eligible voters. And uh, this will fall most heavily on active military, senior citizens, greater Minnesotans, young people, people of color, and working families, and that is every Minnesota family. The legislators who wrote this poorly written amendment, they lacked common sense. They got it wrong. And Minnesotans should vote no. 
Mr. McGrath, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Debate Minnesota, for putting this together and Metro State University for uh, hosting it. I think this is a great venue and a great opportunity to discuss the issue. Every industrialized nation on Earth, with the exception of several of the United States, requires identification to vote. It's a common sense thing. The majority of the world recognizes how simple and obvious it is to require identification to vote. We use ID to protect ourselves against fraud when it comes to banking. How many of you would keep your money in a bank that did not require identification to make withdrawals? No one would say that the bank is trying to deprive them of their right to their money by asking for identification before handing it over to you. The voter ID amendment does four simple things. It requires voters in person to provide photographic identification when voting. It requires the state to make identification available at no charge. It requires a second chance ballot, called a provisional ballot, in case someone is unable to present photo identification on election day for whatever reason. <clears throat> it also requires all voters be sub treated substantially the same in how we verify their identity and eligibility. I think everyone would agree that we should treat people as much the same as is possible, even if we're using different processes uh, to vote. Everything else about the amendment that you'll be hearing, that you have been hearing, is wild speculation at best. If it's not in the amendment, it's not going to happen. It's that simple. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the questions. And uh, uh, Mr. McGrath, we'll start with you. Um, is voter fraud a real problem in Minnesota? Well, Minnesota is currently leading the nation in convictions for voter fraud. We have not seen the number of convictions from a single election in any state in this country since 1936 in Missouri. 200 people have been convicted for voter fraud out of the 2008 election, which is a record for the state of Minnesota and a record for the country since 1936. In addition to that, we have over 6,000 election day registrants from 2008 that are currently flagged for challenge on the voter rolls because they provided names or addresses that didn't check out after the fact. Their ballots have been counted, but we don't know who cast them we don't know where they live or if they're even real people. Ms. Schrantz, do you disagree? Is, is voter fraud an issue in Minnesota? Well, first of all, any allegations of voter fraud or ineligible voting need to be taken very, very seriously. It is essential that our election system have utmost 100% integrity. But the reality is that the accusations of large-scale voter fraud that Minnesota majority alleges are simply not true. Um, Minnesota has, majority has made these allegations, and they have been widely debunked by independent analysts, by local officials. People have looked up and down. And in particular, let's look at the postal verification cards. The postal verification cards are actually a part of a 10-point safeguard system that our election system has. All of that system is meant to establish eligibility at every step along the way. The postal verification cards are actually to establish residence, and it is a routine procedure that the state does to clean the voter rolls, to identify and flag where there might be problems, to actually um, make update registrations, and to ensure that our registrations are actually as accurate as possible. So the signs of postal verification cards going out is actually a sign of this whole uh, system of 10 safeguards actually working. Uh, secondly, the 6,000 number that uh, Mr. McGrath is using is, ac using is actually over a period of 12 years. So it's not true that in 2008 there were 6,000 cards returned. <clears throat> Many of those cards that returned were actually the result of postal carrier error. They were the result of, in a decade, you know, people move, people die, their addresses change. So this is actually a sign, and I'll close, um, that the system is working. It's one of the many ways that we have to safeguard our elections and establish the eligi eligibility of all voters in Minnesota. Mr. McGrath, you've got a minute for a rebuttal. Uh, in reality, the 6,224 return postal verification cards that have led to voters being flagged for challenge to the voter registration system were all the result of election day registrants who used that system and voted in 2008. 
in actuality from that election. There were over 23,000 return postal verification cards. The reason that the card was returned is noted in the system. We can identify those that are not returned for suspicious reasons, such as the voter has moved, postal error, et cetera. And eliminating those non-suspicious PVC card returns leaves us with 6,224 highly suspect, unverifiable voters. Ms. Schrantz, you have a minute to respond. I'll just say again that just pulling out the postal verification cards is like looking at one small part of a huge system that is intended to safeguard our elections. It is meant to establish residency, which is one of the five points that establishes eligibility to vote. There is no evidence that the postal verification cards returning is the sign of anything sketchy happening or any problems. The, the accusations that, that that is the case are just simply not true. Um, we seem to have a basic disagreement over here, uh, uh, here which is more important, fraud or, or access to voting. So I want to ask you, which, uh, and we'll start with you, Ms. Schranz, uh, which is the bigger threat to Minnesota's election system, fraud or lack of access to voting? The first thing to understand about uh, the allegations of fraud is to put it in perspective. There have been widespread allegations of fraud. Uh, because of these allegations, people uh, have researched whether or not it's actually happening. Because in order for our election systems to work, we absolutely do have to establish the integrity of our elections. The Brennan Center for Justice looked over a period of a decade to see are there any cases of voter impersonation fraud happening in America. In a decade, there were 647 million votes cast. There were 13 credible cases of in-person voter fraud that happened in 13 years, and not a single one of those cases happened in Minnesota. So the question that we should be asking is not what's more important, voter fraud or eligibility, but how do the, or, or people having access to the system, but how do those pieces actually work together? We need a system that actually ensures the eligibility of all voters and reaches out and grabs all eligible voters and makes sure that they get pulled in. We need both of those things working together. And right now, Minnesota has a system that works exactly like that. It works very well. And the more that I've looked into the system and uh, the 10 points, the way that we check it every step of the way, that it's not only step checked during an election year, it's checked uh, actually daily. We have a system in Minnesota that we can have confidence in, and only looking at one side of it is a mistake and could have a serious unintended consequences. Mr. McGrath, do you think uh, fraud or lack of access to voting is, is the bigger threat to our election system? Well, I think that the idea that we can only address access or only address fraud is a false dilemma. Uh, there's no reason that we can't make it easy to vote and hard to cheat, and that's what this voter ID amendment sets out to do. Uh, we should have easy access to the polling places. We should not throw up unnecessary barriers to voting. I don't think that we need to drag people into the polling place. It's a voluntary process. Uh, but we should also make sure that we have the utmost integrity in the system. Right now, our election system allows the creation of identities on the spot in the polling place with a combination of vouching and, in, and election day registration. Impersonation fraud is a misnomer, especially in Minnesota, because you don't need to use an actual voter's identity to obtain a ballot fraudulently in Minnesota. I can walk into a polling place with someone to vouch for me and say that my name is John Wayne, and they're gonna say, here's your ballot, Mr. Wayne, and I could do it over and over and over again. One person can vouch for up to 15 individuals in a polling place. Is there evidence that this has been a problem? Yes. From Minneapolis in 2010, uh, a, a university precinct, I forget, I forget which ward it was, it was Lutheran Church, uh, had organizers with Organizing for America stationed in the polling place, systematically vouching for people that they did not even know. They were caught by election judges and poll challengers. It's being investigated by the Minneapolis Police Department at this point. Uh, so we do have problems with our vouching system. I think everyone instinctively can see the gigantic hole in election security that that creates. This voter ID amendment will address that and keep it easy to vote.
Ms. Schranz, rebuttal. It seems that Mr. McGrath and Minnesota Majority see something very, very different than what I see or countless other Minnesotans see when they look at our election system. The important thing to remember about voter impersonation fraud or, or what it is, maybe I should put it this way, how do you know if a voter is eligible? There are five criteria for becoming an eligible voter. You have to be who you say you are. You have to live where you say you live. You have to be over the age of 18. You have to be a citizen. And then you have to make sure that your uh, civil rights have not been revoked for some reason. And there is, it is simply not true that somebody can walk into a polling place and not establish any of those criteria to, uh, to be eligible to vote. If you go on election day registration, you bring a photo ID, you bring proof of residency. The thing that you verify as a voter is that you promise, you sign something, you sign an oath knowing that it's a felony if you don't do it, that you are indeed a citizen, citizen and you haven't had your civil rights revoked and it's checked the next day. Checked the next day. Mr. McGrath, do you want to respond? Uh, well, actually, generally, the checking of election day registrants isn't done until six months after an election. Um, the, the vouching process allows for people to register to vote and cast a live ballot on election day without any identification whatsoever, just the say so of one other voter in the precinct who himself does not need to show any identification. Uh, the system is broken. Minnesotans, I think, instinctively recognize that that's a loophole that we need to close. Now, do we have a huge problem with voter fraud in Minnesota? I don't know. It's significant. It's significant enough to possibly sway close elections. But I don't think that we want the party who cheats the best to have an advantage in our, election, in our electoral process that can be created by voter fraud. Um, please give it down. Um, Mr. Grath, next question is to you. Uh, Ms. Schranz has con contended that uh, a voter ID law would suppress voter turnout. Uh, you disagree? Tell us why. Uh, yes, I do disagree. It has not been the experience of any other state that's enacted voter ID. Voter ID in uh, Indiana resulted in increased voter turnout after the enacting of their law. And I, I will, I've heard people say, well, it's apples and oranges because there was the 2008 presidential election which drove turnout. But comparing gubernatorial elections in Indiana, we saw an increase from pre-voter ID to post-voter ID in voter participation. So the idea that it suppresses turnout seems to defy the facts. And that's been the case in every other state that's implemented voter ID. It seems counterintuitive, but I believe it's simply explained by confidence. People that have confidence in their system that believe their vote is actually going to be counted fairly are more likely to participate. Ms. Schranz? Minnesota has the highest voter turnout in the country. So if Minnesotans don't have confidence in their election system, there's very little evidence of it. Um, so I think that one thing is being missed in this conversation, was, which is that this is simply not about, it's not just about photo ID or whether or not people identify themselves at the poll. It is the amendment that has been written is actually a doorway into an overhaul of our election system. And there are a set of critical questions to ask about that. Do we want same day registration? What does it mean to have provisional balloting? What kind of system do we actually have right now? Does it work? Does it safeguard? And I, what is most disturbing about this amendment to me is not just the question of whether or not people should have a strict uh, rule that people should have a certain type of photo identification, but the implications in the amendment for every aspect of our election system. And, uh, and we have to get to the point where we're actually talking about that. Mr. McGrath, your, your response? Um, <clears throat> I've been hearing it said in a lot of corners, including from our Secretary of State's office, that the voter ID amendment will somehow spell the end of election day registration. It's false. It's impossible for the amendment to do that. The words election day registration do not appear in the amendment. It would require an act of the legislature to make that happen. And that act of the legislature would have to be signed by Governor Dayton to become law. Governor Dayton's a supporter of election day registration, so in short, that's not going to happen. 
provisional ballots are employed by 44 other states. Minnesota is one of only six states with unusual election systems that exempts us from the federal requirement to use provisional ballots. They're not a complex process. Indiana has a similar voting population in Minnesota. In the high turnout election of 2008, the entire state saw 4,000 provisional ballots cast. Superimpose that onto Minnesota, where we have 4,103 election precincts, you're looking at a, a le an average of less than one provisional ballot cast per precinct. The amendment only accomplishes the four things I mentioned earlier, and all the other things are just speculation. I'd like to follow up on that. Um, in 2008, about 500,000 Minnesotans out of 3 million who cast votes, one in six voters uh, registered on the election day. Uh, Ms. Schranz, why do you think that they, how, how would they be affected if we had voter ID? Thank you. Uh, this amendment, and a lot of Minnesotans haven't actually read the amendment language, so I would actually like to read to you the trickiest part of the amendment language, which opens up this question. So the trickiest part of the amendment language is Part C. And Part C says, all voters, including those not voting in person, must be subject to substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification prior to casting a ballot or that ballot being counted. So substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification prior to a ballot being cast. Same day registration rests on this presumption. You go in, you establish that you are who you say you are using a photo identification. You establish that you live where you say you live. But the problem is uh, a photo identification does not establish eligibility to vote. Most people's photo identification establishes eligibility to drive, but eligibility to drive is not the same as eligibility to vote. So the voter do, using same-day registration, what they do is swear an oath that they are a citizen and they have not had their voting rights revoked. How is it possible that electronic, a, a poll worker could actually instantaneously establish eligibility during a same-day registration process? And this is strict language. This will be in the Constitution, and it will allow our legislature very little leeway when they're writing, um, uh, uh, implementing legislation. So the thing that we need to be aware of and talk about, which will not be on the ballot when you vote, is this phrase, all voters, including voters not voting in person, must be subject to substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification prior to a ballot being cast or counted. Ms. McGrath, is, is she right? Is her interpretation of the ver verification requirement accurate? Well, I, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out why anyone would object to requiring eligibility and identity verification prior to a ballot being cast or counted or to all voters being treated the same. That's a constitutional principle of equal protection under the law. But there's really nothing complicated or mysterious about substantially equivalent eligibility and identity verification. The eligibility portion currently is accomplished behind the scenes for people that register at least 20 days ahead of, of, of an election. But election day registrants aren't subject to the same scrutiny until later. Now, they're just electronic databases that voter registrations are compared to to establish eligibility <coughs> excuse me, for uh, advanced registrants. Those same databases can all be compiled into one master list called a challenge list. Anyone that's on that list will be challenged in the polling place, whether it's a paper list or on the electronic poll book technology that the Secretary of State has proposed and I support. Uh, it, it's not a complex process. It'll take just as long as having your debit card approved uh, when you go to buy gasoline at the, at the convenience store. Ms. Schranz, uh, it sounds like maybe we've got the technology that solves the verification uh, process, you know, well, it's able uh, to do it very quickly. There is, uh, there, 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 is there is technology in the sense that the, the state cross-checks the voter registration rolls with other databases to ensure eligibility. So you could cross-check it with the database at the Department of Public Safety, you cross-check it with the database at the Department of Public Health, the Social Security Administration. That's how you establish eligibility. But what Mr. McGrath is not answering is how on a day where we have same-day registration, you would be able to establish the entire eligibility. The technology that he's talking about right now, I don't, I don't know that that exists. We don't know how much it would cost. We don't know how it would be implemented. 
So to say that same-day registration will not be impacted by the passage of this legislation is simply not true. Do I have more time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. McGrath, you want to respond? I, I'm not sure that it's necessary to respond. But the, the technology, the, it could be paper. You could just have a list of people known to be ineligible to vote in the polling place. We've had that technology for quite a while. Mr. McGrath, uh, Ms. Schranz brought up the issue of the cost. What would it cost uh, taxpayers to implement a voter ID requirement? I've, I've seen estimates all over the place, but I haven't seen really solid figures. Uh, do you, uh, and what would it cost individuals who don't have the documents to get their needed IDs? Uh, Mr. McGrath, yes. For me. Um, individuals that currently lack identification, which there aren't a lot. The Secretary of State has estimated there's about 200,000 people but that's a, it's a flawed process that he's using because he's examined only people that don't have a state-issued driver's license or a state-issued identification card, failed to account for tribal IDs, passports, uh, military IDs, and various other government identifications would be accepted by the amendment. And he also lumped together with that figure people whose address on their identification does not match their voter registration. But the voter ID amendment does not say address verification. It does not say residence anywhere in the amendment. It's not required that your identification have your current address on it. So the, the entire 200,000 figure is highly suspect and, and flawed to begin with. But for those few that do lack identification, I know a couple of people that don't have it. They'll be provided an identification at no charge. It's going to be at state expense. We expect the state will pay somewhere around $2 million the first year in order to get those people identification. To the individual, there's no cost. Some have suggested there could be costs if they have to get a birth certificate or something like that in order to get the uh, identification card. But if you don't have identification, or <clears throat> I'm sorry, if you don't have a birth certificate, if you have an extraordinary hardship in obtaining the birth certificate or other supporting documents that you need to get your identification, there's already a process in place in current state law called a petition for variance that enables people in those circumstances to get ID without those primary and secondary documents. It takes a little longer to get your ID because the Department of Public Safety has to check out your story, but ultimately there's no cost to the voter and it's a minimal cost to the state for election integrity for the five million residents of Minnesota. Ms. Schranz, uh, give us your answer to what it would cost Minnesotans. What it's going to cost? Yeah. Uh, it seems simple, again, on the service, but under the hood it is not it's not simple at all. There are actually three layers of costs that implementing this bill will cost the state of Minnesota. And the first layer of cost is the state. So the free ID program would not only be to pass out the IDs, it would also be a public education program. Indiana, which passed a free ID program, um, a voter identification program, wildly underestimated the costs of what, of, of what it would cost them to do this. They ended up, they, they budgeted about $700,000. They ended up over three years passing out 771,000 photo IDs, and it cost them $10 million. At the local level, local governments are responsible for paying for the election system as it plays out in local counties. So if, and this language that I told you about that's kind of tricky that you're not going to see on the ballot, if it is true that we do not have the same system of same-day registration and we have to put in place a significant provisional balloting system and counties like Kitson County that has 2,800 voters that has a totally mail-in system right now because that's what works for them in rural Minnesota. They might have to change everything over to an in-person polling place. Kitson County, the county officials there estimate it will cost them $750,000, which they will have to pay for out of their property tax base. That's $250 per voter. And then individuals not only have to pay for documentation. Now, the variance issue that uh, Mr. McGrath just, that just brought up is actually not that simple. And anyone who's ever been to the DMV or ever been through any kind of bureaucratic process understands that it is not that simple. But the, and in fact, they don't actually grant variances. One in three times, they don't grant it. That being said, individuals, especially in greater Minnesota, they would have to drive to the county seat. And we all know that this is a big state. People travel long distances. So they would also be paying gas mileage. So it's the state, 
it's the local government and it's the individual that will pay for this at all this level. And the truth is, we don't really know how it's all going to play out, which is why this amendment needs to go back, send it back to the legislature. Mr. McGrath, uh, do you want to respond to the long list of costs that she tabled? If, if it isn't in the amendment language itself, and if it isn't in our statutes, it is wild speculation at best about possible future legislation. The legislature could mandate that all ballots be printed on Swiss cheese in the next uh, legislative session, but a bill like that would be as likely to be vetoed by the governor as any bill that would eliminate election day registration or mail-in balloting. Mail-in balloting works like absentee balloting, which isn't eliminated by the amendment. The amendment specifically separates in-person voters in one paragraph from voters not in person in the next paragraph. It's done for a reason. It's to preserve both of those processes and establish separate processes, different, but that will accomplish substantially the same identity and eligibility verification. Ms. Schranz, couldn't the governor and the legislature hold down the costs that you listed? The, the, what's being failed to recognize here, it is, it is not why... It is not wild speculation. So first of all, county officials, who lo nonpartisan local officials, do you know what they do every day? They crunch the numbers. They put together the budgets. And so if county officials across the state of Minnesota are starting to do the prudent and fiscally responsible thing, is to anticipate and predict what this might mean for them. And they are starting to put those numbers down on paper. It is not wild speculation. It is local officials who manage budgets every year and try to make their communities work. Secondly, this piece of the amendment, substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification, the problem is this is the Constitution, and then there's state statute. And basically what this is going to do is put the Constitution and state statute in conflict with one another. So the Constitution is going to state certain things about what is required, and state statute is going to have to adapt election day registration, mail-in balloting, um, and absentee voting. Mr. Ron's, um, Mr. McGrath brought up the question of, of cheating in elections, and why should it be easier to cheat in elections than it is to cheat in everyday transactions like buying a beer or getting on an airplane? It's not easy to cheat in our elections. It's just not. There are system, the way, the way I would think about this is the Minnesota election system is actually a very sophisticated process that actually checks identity and eligibility at every step of the way. You have, uh, if you're gonna do election day registration, you get a photo identification and you have to say where you live. And then your information is checked, cross-checked. Do you know how often right now the state cross-checks the um, voter registration rolls with the Department of Public Safety to flag who might be felons who have had their civil rights revoked? They do it daily. They update our voter registration rolls daily, and that's been happening since 2010. We um, cross-check things with our Social Security administrations, and this is not happening just on the fly. It's a, it's a system that's tight, and it's actually got whole sets of safeguards. The idea that you can just pretend to be John Wayne at a polling station is absolutely ludicrous. That absolutely cannot happen. That it that cannot happen. Mr. McGrath, uh, can you get away with claiming you're John Wayne? Yes. Is it, is it easy to cheat in Minnesota? It, it is extraordinarily easy because of vouching. Now, if, if election day registration actually did require photo ID, like Ms. Schranz is suggesting, then we've already accomplished what I've set out to do here, and we can stop this debate and I'll go home. It's not true. It, <laughs> election day registration doesn't require identification. All you need is somebody that can vouch for you, that you are who you say you are and live where you say you live. And there are many instances in which people have been caught vouching for people that they don't even actually know. That is the entire security of our election day registration system, and those people that are registered to vote that way are given a ballot on the spot. It goes into the ballot box, and it is irretrievable. If we find out later that person doesn't exist or doesn't live in the precinct they say they live, too late. There's nothing we can do about it. 
So we want to verify before they cast a ballot instead of after. And we'll save a lot of expense in trying to track down and prosecute voter fraud after the fact. The county attorneys have uh, investigated well over a thousand instances of suspected voter fraud at great expense. They've complained about it because it pulls resources away from other things they want to work on, murders, rapes, burglaries, things like that. But of course, voter fraud is important. Election integrity is important. It's the foundation of our entire republic, <coughs> confidence in our election system. So that's important. But we can save that expense of those investigations if we just verify ahead of time instead of trying to track it down after the fact. Ms. Schranz, you want to respond? Sure. So, uh, again, there, there's, there's no substantiated evidence, no, no, no actual cases substantiated evidence of voter impersonation fraud happening in Minnesota. It, it's just, it, it's not happening. So, vouching, that, that is an interesting scenario in Minnesota. It's pretty interesting. It's actually a pretty simple legal process. So what happens if you vouch for somebody, you know them. And 77% of vouching that happens in the state of Minnesota, it's actually people who live at the same address from each other. So it's a mom vouching for their kid because they've never voted before. It's somebody who's down on their luck vouching for somebody who's living with them. So vouching is actually, it's, it's not the majority of how people are voting. When you go in and vouch for somebody, again, you have to sign a document that says you know that person. It is not true that the Secretary of State or the state offices or the election officials can't find you. They can absolutely find you. You signed a document and said you swore to the, to the government that you knew this person and you knew that the, who they were and where they lived. Mr. McGrath, she makes a case that uh, vouching is safe. Uh, well, <laughs> let me take a different tack with this. Our ballots control billions and trillions of public dollars. The idea that we can take somebody's word for it when they're making a withdrawal of that size and magnitude just on a signature that they are who they say they are and live where they say they live, I I'm sorry, I I it's ludicrous. Uh, Mr. McGrath, uh, assuming that we do need voter identification, uh, voter identification requirement, why do we need one of the strictest ones in the nation, as, as Minnesota's has been characterized as? Well, some, some people have called it that, but uh, really the uh, voter ID amendment in Minnesota is based on Crawford v. Marion, which is the Supreme Court decision in the Indiana voter ID law. Now, at the time, they were calling Indiana's the strictest in the nation, but when the Supreme Court vetted their law, they laid down certain stipulations for what they would consider constitutional in a voter ID law. One of them is that the identification has to be provided at no charge. Another one is the provisional ballots have to be provided as a, a safe gap to make sure that no one is turned away from the polling place without a chance to cast a ballot. So our law, our, our voter ID amendment, is based entirely or very, very closely on that Crawford v. Marion decision. I don't see it as a strict thing. I see it as a very simple thing. And um, <clears throat> the, the provisional balloting process will protect people that are currently being turned away from the polls in Minnesota. If you've recently moved, don't have any utility bills in your name, maybe you have a roommate that gets all the utility bills in their name, if you just moved into a precinct, you're not going to get to vote unless you can find someone that's willing to accompany you to the polls and vouch for you. Maybe you don't know your neighbors yet. Maybe nobody's around that's willing to go with you to the polling place. You're turned away without a chance to vote. That happens now under our current law. The provisional ballot will make sure that that never, ever happens. If you show up at the polls and you want to vote, you're going to get to vote. Ms. Schranz? If we pass this amendment as it stands right now, it will make Minnesota have the strictest voting system in the nation. Every other state that has passed photo ID, uh, voter identification laws of any kind has actually created safeguards for different classes of voters. For example, they've exempted people like active military or people who live in nursing homes or people who have been long, long time voters or people who are disabled. All, uh, Alabama has exemptions. Wisconsin had a set of safeguards for different groups of people. Minnesota, because of this language of all voters, 
all voters, including those not voting in person, must be subject to substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification prior to casting a ballot. That means no exceptions. If all these other states that actually passed voter identification laws could put safeguards in place for different kinds of voters, recognizing that voters and people are at different stages of their lives for different reasons, why couldn't Minnesota? If we pass this amendment in the Constitution, what's going to happen when it goes to the legislature is that they're not going to be able to create these safeguards because the Constitution is the primary document. So they will not be able to create enabling legislation that actually protects whole set of voters. And I will talk about provisional balloting in a moment. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. McGrath, do you want to rebut her? Well, military voters overseas have identification. They have military ID that's acceptable under the voter ID amendment. If they, uh, even if that weren't true, which it is, there are federal laws that govern military absentee voting. It's called the MOVE Act and UOCAVA, the Uniformed Overseas and Absentee Voting Act. Uh, they override any state law or even a constitutional amendment to protect military voting. That federal process cannot be affected by this voter ID amendment. If a, if a soldier wants to vote an ordinary Minnesota absentee ballot, they can use their military ID, they can use the state ID they've got, the driver's license they probably already have, uh, so it's not an issue there. Senior citizens, if you're 65 or older, when you get your identification card of its non-driving ID, it never expires. It'll be provided at no charge. Other states, for people that are uh, homebound, have medical reasons that they can't travel to get identification, they've established systems to bring a truck right to the individual. I don't see why we can't do that in Minnesota. Uh, it's really not a big issue. Uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures in April issued a report that suggested that the worst fears of both sides of this issue are overblown. It said, quote, so far little evidence exists that fraud by imp impersonation at the polls is a common problem. Likewise, little evidence exists that large numbers of people have been barred from voting in states with strict voter ID laws. Isn't this really a debate about politics? Isn't it about whether, the, whether both Democrats and Republicans are seeking an advantage in close elections? Ms. Schrantz? Well, I think that as you stated in the beginning of this, messing, I don't, this wasn't a, just not a direct quote, but messing around with the Constitution is serious business. It's serious civic business. And it is unfortunate that the unbelievable toxic nature of our partisan politics and our politics of these times end up co sort of corrupting every public conversation that we try to have. The reason I am here is not because I want to advocate for one side or the other. It's because I really care about how our democracy works and changing our constitution is serious business. And anyone who is um, going to make a decision in the ballot box has to actually read this. And any responsible policymaker, and you know what guys, right now we're the policymakers, has to actually unpack all the implications, the unintended consequences, the costs, and the serious complications that this amendment could create for something as important as how we elect our public officials and who gets to be a part of that process. So I, I don't think our uh, concerns are overblown. I think they're responsible and prudent concerns given the seriousness and of what's at stake. But it has been a very partisan debate. As you know, it, uh, in Minnesota, in the legislature this last year, the uh, constitutional amendment passed the House on a straight party line vote. In the Senate, there was just one Republican no vote. All the rest of the Republicans voted yes. All the Democrats voted no. Isn't this under, underlying at all? Isn't it a partisan issue, Dan? Uh, no. In the legislature, it was. Uh, there's a certain class of political elite in the Democrat Party that... <clears throat> do not want voter ID. But if you look at the Star Tribune poll from last year, it showed that 65% of Democrats supported voter ID. That's a big majority. So the legislators were not representing their constituents or the will of their own political party. And you can look at Rhode Island, 
where an entirely Democrat majority in the legislature there enacted voter ID overwhelmingly. And it was signed by you know, not a well-known conservative uh, governor in Rhode Island. So no, uh, recently uh, former Democrat Congressman Archer Davis from uh, Georgia came out in support of voter ID. Uh, so it's not a partisan thing, it's a common sense thing. There's just certain small group of political class people that oppose voter ID. Well, I think you both have just rebutted me, uh, <laughs> but you still have an opportunity to, to, to respond if you'd like to, Ms. Schranz. I, I just, I think it's terribly unfortunate that the partisanship conversation takes us away from what this constitutional amendment actually says and what it actually means for voters and democracy in Minnesota. And what happens is everybody takes the easy road of categorizing people around partisanship as you're trying to actually unpack what this means, okay? What this will mean if we pass it is there will be serious stakes for potentially disenfranchising people. It fails to safeguard people's rights to vote. It will be an extreme makeover of an election system in Minnesota that works. It works so well. We're the best. We're the best in the country. <laughs> so I, I think our conversation and everybody here and all the Minnesota voters who are going to make this decision, you're going to decide, not some elite class of politicians. You're going to decide. And you're going to have to decide what's most important. So we have to take this back from that conversation. Mr. McGrath, would you like to respond to her? Um, what? <clears throat> I, I'm sorry, but the, the, the idea that we have the best election system in the country is <laughs> something I'm trying to wrap my head around. I think we can get there. We can be a, a nation-leading model for election integrity, access, and security. And that's what the Voter ID Amendment sets out to do. Uh, you know, Canada requires photo ID to vote. Mexico, our neighbor to the south, requires photo ID to vote. They've got a very elaborate photo ID system for elections down in Mexico. Uh, several of the United States, but not all, require some form of identification to vote. Uh, it's a common sense thing that we all instinctively understand. And if we, if we just bring this about, we can establish once again the preeminence of Minnesota's election system and set an example for the nation of how to do this with access and security. Uh, Mr. McGrath, the, the proposed amendment would set up, you, there have been a couple of references to the provisional ballot system, and wouldn't uh, people who cast provisional ballots be almost discouraged from coming back if they knew how the, the results of the election were, that they, they didn't really need to vote? Uh, wouldn't they just be likely not to bother to go back and verify that they are who they said they were, and in, in that case, their votes wouldn't be counted? Uh, in, in some instances, that's definitely going to happen. I don't have any question about that. If it's not a close election and there's only about 4,000 provisional ballots sitting in the pool, there is no reason to go back and certify those ballots. But if it is a close election, I guarantee you the people are going to go down and make sure that their ballot gets certified. If it's going to make a difference, then they're going to certify their ballots. If it's, if it's not, then they're not. Ms. Schranz, what's wrong with that? So provisional balloting is complicated. It's a two-step voting system. And if you look at other states, it's a mixed bag. Uh, large percentages of provisional ballots never get counted. And some of that is because it is a burden on the voter to drive significant amounts of way, uh, uh, away. Or, or they think, maybe my vote doesn't really matter. But sometimes it's also caused by error. And large percentages of provisional ballots aren't counted. But here's the thing that we have to really think about in Minnesota. So same day registration is the crown jewel of Minnesota's election system. And it is in state statute. So if we pass this amendment, and because now if we pass this amendment, we will have to establish all the parts of eligibility on the same day. That means your simple photo identification uh, that only says where, who you are and where you live does not fully establish your eligibility to vote. So that means potentially you're going to have a massive provisional balloting system. 500,000 people uh, 
become registered to vote on election day in the last, in the last, last three presidential elections. Minnesotans love same day registration. We use it a lot. So in order to actually deal with this amendment, which means you have to establish eleg eligibility, we'll either have to change state statute to actually get rid of same day registration, or if you go to register on the same day, you might have your, your different forms of ID, your establishing of residence, but we will not be able to establish full eligibility. And so you will have to cast a provisional ballot, which is a, all, it's like a side-by-side -side voting system. It means you will cast your ballot, it will go into an envelope, it will not be counted that day. It will not be counted until your full eligibility is verified. You're, you're a citizen and you have not had your civil rights revoked. We could have 500,000 provisional ballots in Minnesota. No other state has a strict voto ID law and same day registration. We would be the only ones to do that. Mr. McGrath, you want to respond? Um, it helps to understand what the amendment says. Uh, where it refers to provisional ballots, the paragraph refers only to voters unable to present photographic identification in the polling place. It doesn't say anything about giving a provisional ballot to someone whose eligibility hasn't been verified. The amendment does not contemplate the possibility that eligibility verification cannot take place immediately in the polling place. That's why they're separated into separate paragraphs. If you don't have ID, you get a provisional ballot, period. If you walk into a polling place and for some reason they couldn't verify your eligibility, it, it, it doesn't even contemplate that. It's not in the universe of the amendment or the statutes. Uh, ident identification is the trigger for provisional ballots. That's all. So this nightmare scenario of 500,000 provisional ballots is not possible. The amendment isn't written that way. Uh, next question, uh, uh, Ms. Schranz. Um, Mr. McGrath referred to the 6,000 voters uh, who registered on Election Day in 2008 and provided uh, names or addresses that could not be verified after the ballots were accepted. Don't we need some kind of system to verify that voters who are who they say they are? We do have a system to verify that voters are who they say they are. If you actually go... Uh, to the, to the website, which tells you how to register to vote, it's actually a flexible mix and match system of verification. If you register on, say, on the same day, you do have to bring some kind of identification, and you have to bring some evidence that you actually live where you say you live. The question of eligibility has nothing to do with identification, meaning I say who I am, you, you do have to verify that, and there's multiple ways you can verify it. What you can't verify on same day is whether or not your civil rights have been revoked or whether or not you're a citizen, because most uh, government-issued IDs don't say those things, including military IDs. Okay. Uh, Mr. McGrath? Uh, I would just say, how does the Secretary of State and the county auditors verify eligibility for people that register 20 days ahead of the election? There's a system for that. We can bring that system into the polling place or something very similar to it, substantially equivalent, and uh, we don't have a problem. As I said, this, this technology, this magic technology that we could use is a piece of paper with a list of everyone that's known to be ineligible to vote. <laughs> Ms. Raz, <laughs> you seem to be uh, disagreeing over there. So, um, I, this amendment uh, will leave a lot up to interpretation of the language. If you look at it and you actually read it, it's contradictory and it's illogical. And it is in conflict with state statute. It's badly written. It's bad. It should go back to the legislature to go through a responsible policy-making process where we can actually talk accountably about the costs and consequences and complications. So I, um, that's what I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. McGrath, you get the last word on this one. 
Uh, okay, you know, I, I've heard a lot about how confusing the voter ID amendment is. It really, it isn't, but I, I'm starting to understand how some people are confused by it because some people have these preconceived notions that it's going to do all of these horrible apocalyptic, apocalyptic things to our election system, but then when they actually sit down and read the text, they can't seem to find anywhere in there where that's going to happen, and that leaves them confused. But I'm reading the text. Okay, okay, you've answered. <laughs> You'll get more opportunities. Okay. Uh, we're going to ch start asking some questions now that have been submitted by members of the audience. And I've gotten several questions that are kind of similar, but uh, let me start with this one, Mr. McGrath. Why is it necessary to amend the Constitution? Isn't that a drastic step? Couldn't we do this through legislation? Uh, some states have done it through legislation. Uh, Mississippi recently did it through a constitutional amendment. It was attempted in Missouri as well as a constitutional amendment. Uh, Article 7, Section 1 of the Minnesota Constitution is one paragraph that establishes our election system and establishes the qualifications for voting. Back when that was written, 100 and some years ago, uh, they didn't have the urban centers like we do now, and they didn't have the technology available like we do now. And so they omitted to say, oh, and by the way, we're going to verify that. Uh, I think it's an appropriate place to add this verification step right to where all of the other qualifications for voting are spelled out in the Constitution. Uh, Ms. Schranz, what's wrong with sticking at the Constitution? Because it's the Constitution. Because if we want to make any changes to it, if we pass this and then afterwards we say, oops, there's a bunch of things we didn't think through, then we can't change it. So the difference between a constitutional amendment and passing legislation is that legislation, as messy as it can be, and I know it can be messy, at least it's an accountable process in which people can actually talk through the price tag, uh, who's going to be impacted. You can refine it so that you can minimize bad things and maximize good things. That's what a legislative process does. But once we put it in the Constitution, it's, it's, it's the basis on which all legislation will be crafted. So the Constitution is not the right place for this. It's definitely not the right place for this. There are too many questions. There's too many um, uh, complications and potential consequences that we, uh, we just haven't thought through and we haven't had an open discussion about as Minnesotans, like do we want to keep same-day registration? Do we like mail-in balloting when you're in a northern rural county? Are those things important to us? And if so, uh, how can, can we make them better? Are there ways to make them better? That's what can happen in a legislative process. But once you, ensh you enshrine it in the Constitution, it's another ballot initiative that would be required to change it. Um, Mr. McGrath, we've got a, a related another related question from, from the audience that says, why are we being asked to amend the Constitution without knowing the specific changes that will be made in our election system? Uh, but well, I mean, the specific changes are there. There's the four points that I mentioned. Identification will be required when you vote in person. Something substantially equivalent will be required to verify the eligibility and identity of people not voting in, in person. Identification will be provided at no charge. Provisional ballots will be provided for people that are unable to produce identification on election day. There's very few details, actually, that need to be worked out. One of them would be how do we run the education campaign that the Supreme Court will require of us. And how do we manage our provisional ballots? How many days do we give people to come back and certify them? What is the process for certifying them? That is pretty much all that is not specified in the amendment and the current statutes. If you look at how they interact with one another, it's very elegant in how it's written. You've got to keep in mind the chief author of this bill, Representative Mary Kiffmeyer, was the Secretary of State for eight years. She knows the election system inside and out. This thing was written with the greatest experts on election law in the state of Minnesota, and they knew what they were doing. Ms. Schron, do you agree that we know everything we need to know? In the I do not. No, I don't agree that we know everything we need to know. I, I think there are tremendous unanswered questions and things that are not figured out. And I, when, when county officials across the state, when election officials in Kitson County start talking about what it might mean for them that they might have to ha pay $750,000 to end their mail-in balloting system so they can put in-person polling in place because the interpretation of this Part C looks pretty clear. 
it means all voters. The other thing people need to understand is there was an initial reading of this on the part of the uh, Minnesota State Supreme Court, and they verified some of the reading of this Part C that I, I've been I've been interpreting um, it to mean in the last in the last hour. So we will potentially have a conflict, and there are a lot of unanswered questions, and I don't really see the elegant. Uh, joining of state statute with this amendment. So, um, so I think if for no other reason, the way this amendment is written and the unanswered questions should be enough for most Minnesotans to just vote no and send it back. And if they wanna put a proposal on the table to tighten up our election systems, let's take a look at what it is. To uh, speed things along and, and see if we can get more audience questions, as I'm, I'm not going to ask you for rebuttals, but if you do want to issue a rebuttal, just let me know and, and you, you can do so. Okay. Do you, uh, want, me, do you want to discuss? Real quick, the, the answers to the questions that people commonly have are available. Uh, I don't expect that everyone is going to know everything about our 13 chapters of election law and how the voter ID amendment interacts with it. I'm fairly familiar with it because I've been doing this for five years, uh, almost exclusively but you can find the answers at protectmyvote.com on the frequently asked questions and on the myths versus facts. Ms. Schranz? Okay. Uh, this is from a Metro State student. Would a student, a Metro State, Metro State student ID qualify as a photo ID under the amendment? Uh, and let me add to that. Uh, the law speaks to a government issued uh, um, uh, identification I suppose since this is a state university, that might be government issued, but what would happen to a, a private college student? Uh, let's see, whose turn is it? It's yours, Ms. Schranz. Oh, good, okay. So the truth about that is a great question. The truth about that question is we don't know. So what uh, gover it does say government issued uh, in the actual amendment. Just so you know, there were people in the legislature who offered amendments to make it, for example, government approved instead of government issued so that it would create some more flexibility to, for example, accept student IDs. Right now, our system accepts student IDs if and only if the college actually submits its residency roles to the Secretary of State so that you can actually see that there, there's an establishment of residency along with identity. See what I'm saying? So. Currently, you can go and use your student ID as long as your college has complied with the rules of the state. Um, so the second problem is uh, with this question of, uh, of IDs is the only thing we really have to reference is the legislation that was actually already passed by the same legislature that put this amendment on the ballot. That legislation was a very strict interpretation of which IDs would count and which ones wouldn't. There would not have been any student IDs. Um, uh, there's some question about tribal IDs. I know that was, that was, in, and, that was in and out, um, not military IDs. It would have to be a government-issued photo identification, which takes away the flexibility of the state and all of us to actually put the pieces together to establish eligibility and identity in multiple ways. Mr. McGrath? I private college student identification will not be allowed by the voter ID amendment, that's clear. It's not government issued. There's some question as to whether public universities could be considered government issued identification more than likely in order to treat similarly situated people the same. College identification of any kind is not going to be permitted by the next legislature. I'm just guessing on that. I think it's unlikely that they'll allow any student ID, but identification will be provided at no charge to anyone that wants them. If you've got an old ID from Georgia, California, wherever the student comes from, that doesn't have their current address in the precinct, they'll still be able to use that for identification. They'll still be able to use the student housing lists or fee statements or whatever like that to establish their residency. So that's not really a, a big challenge. So students should be able to get a free ID from the state? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Another question from the audience. Why were there no provisions included in the amendment for our military service members, uh, particularly those overseas? Uh, Mr. McGrath? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, it's on military service. How, how, are they, how would they be treated under the voter ID amendment? 
Well, if you're overseas deployed military, you can use your military ID or your state driver's license or your state ID card or anything else that you have this government issued photo ID and you just record the number on the signature envelope to be verified behind the scenes by election officials. As I've said, military voting is governed and protected by federal law, UOCAVA and the MOVE Act. And that process is unchanged by the constitutional amendment. So I mean, soldiers are not going to see a change in how they go about voting. Is that true, Ms. Schranz? That, that is not necessarily true at all. Um, those federal laws cover, they, they actually um, prevent certain kinds of um, rejections of ballots from active military personnel, like the type of paper that it's on or how it's formatted. But states are allowed to run their own election systems, and they're allowed uh, to create their own eligibility requirements. That's, that's part of the deal. So there's no, th these laws do not prevent Minnesota from, say, from, from rejecting a, a ballot of an active military personnel person uh, because we reject that they didn't prove their identity or eligibility sufficiently. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience is, how would this bill affect homeless people? Ms. Schranz? Well, that's a great question. You know, this question about who has an ID and who doesn't, it, it really does require some imagination of people who have different kinds of lives than we have. So that's a great question. I am not sure what would happen to somebody who was transient or down on their luck or had some extensive period of homelessness or was moving around. Um, we have to establish identity and residency in order for someone to vote. So we have things in place right now to make sure that if you are eligible to vote, you're a citizen, you're over the age of 18, you are who you say you are, we will draw you in, to, we will draw you in. and sometimes that happens through vouching. A staff person can vouch for somebody who lives in a shelter. But because of the rigid and illogical nature of this particular amendment, I, I think the real question is, is we don't know. We don't know what will happen. We know what will happen with the system we have right now, but we don't know what will happen if we pass this amendment as it is. Mr. McGrath. Uh, people that are in those extraordinary circumstances are probably having a pretty rough time in life, uh, especially if they don't have identification. The state will provide identification to anyone that needs it at no charge, and that's going to help people in more ways than just for voting. It's very difficult to function in society without identification these days. For homeless people, many homeless shelters require identification to get a meal or to check in and get a bed for the night. Uh, the government will be providing identification to these people at no charge, which will make their lives easier in more ways than one. Okay. Did you want to respond to that? Well, once again, I think it would be great for everyone to have photo identification, and I certainly would be supportive of there being um, systems in place so that everybody, no matter what their circumstances, could have some kind of photo ID. I, I think, once again, this conversation gets off track. This is not about whether or not everybody has a photo ID. It's about how we establish identity and eligibility for people to vote. That's what's at stake in this amendment, not about whether or not we're passing out free IDs. Do you support the idea that we have a flexible and interactive um, system that actually allows for people to participate in that system even though they're in different circumstances in their lives they live really far away. They need to use mail-in balloting. They are active military, and they need to self-certify an absentee ballot. You are homeless, and you need to be vouched for this once. Th that's what this is about. It's not about whether or not people have photo IDs. Do you want to respond to that, Mr. McGrath? Okay. And then uh, a related uh, question, a different ethnic group. A uh, question is, uh, does the, will the government issue our ideas include tribal identifications? The question to me? Yes. Uh, yeah, it absolutely will. It has to. Uh, federal ruling has already established for Minnesota that tribal IDs have to be accepted for voting. Uh, that's established case law. Even if we tried to amend the Constitution in a way that would prohibit tribal ID, it wouldn't fly. 
The federal courts have already made that determination. That's part of the reason that the word government issued rather than state issue was chosen in the amendment so that tribal governments could uh, issue IDs that would be acceptable for voting. Ms. Ranz, do you agree? No, you don't. Okay. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Um, I, I just, I think this falls into the same category of we're not entirely sure what will happen and whether or not we will ultimately be able to accept tr tribal IDs. There's some evidence uh, that what Mr. McGrath is saying is true. They, they, they could be considered government issued. Um, there's also some evidence in legislative process, processes um, that have unfolded uh, trying to revoke the use in Minnesota of tribal IDs as appropriate or legitimate identification to vote. So both those things are true. There's another question from the audience. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Ms. Schranz. Who stands to benefit politically from this amendment and who stands to lose? Well, now that would be wild speculation. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> The voters will win. The voters the will win. That was a good answer. All right. <laughs> so um, this is a politicized issue, uh, and there have been there have been uh, statements saying that the people who are advocating for voter identification laws are trying to suppress the votes of people who are more likely to vote for Democrats and uh, vice versa. So I, sitting here, can't say whether or not that is true. I think it is true that the people who would most likely be impacted, so if you look at who does not have photo identification, who are in positions in their lives where things are more unstable, or they're at different stages of their lives, the elderly, the young, people of color, people who are poor, you might be able to argue um, that those people are more likely to vote for Democrats. I don't know if that's necessarily true. What's most important is we shouldn't pass policies or programs that disproportionately impact, disproportionately impact people who are at vulnerable stages of their lives. We sh safeguarding a system and making sure it has integrity means everybody who's eligible needs an on-ramp into that system. Mr. McGrath, would this amendment dis uh, affect the poor, the, uh, the young, the old, disproportionately? That hasn't been the experience in other states. It is has not, not the experience. Has not been. That has not been the experience in other states, no. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience is, uh, given the state's projected deficit and the $2.7 billion owed to the schools, where specifically will the money come from to pay for the implementation of uh, this voter ID law? And uh, Mr. McGrath, it's your turn. Well, obviously, it's going to come from the state general fund budget. And I'd just like to point out that as we're building the uh, central corridor, we're spending over a billion dollars on seven miles of track that's going to benefit a small community of riders in one localized neighborhood. The entire state's paying for that. Compared to that, voter ID costs are quite a bargain for the five million residents of Minnesota when it will benefit the entire election system and every voter of Minnesota equally. Ms. Schranz, isn't he right? Isn't, didn't, wouldn't this just be a drop in the state well, budget if, bucket? No, it, it, if you only look at this question that there's some sort of abstracted program where we're passing out free IDs, that may be true. But if you actually look at the experience of other states that have used photo ID, have actually done these free ID programs like Indiana, they spent $10 million on these free IDs. The other piece that cannot be stated strongly enough is that it is, it is not just the state, it's the local governments that are going to have to bear the burden of many of these costs. And that means you are going to see it in your property taxes. So the thing that everyone should be suspicious about is the idea that anything at all is free. We all know that when you make changes, like if you've ever run a household or a business or an organization or been alive, you know that any time you change anything, it, it, it costs resources and you have to be transparent about what the resources are, where they're going to come from, who's going to pay for it, and is this, Minnesota, the priority that we have 
for our precious public dollars. And we have not been given the opportunity to actually ask that question of ourselves. Ms. Schranz, uh, 30 other states have various forms of voter ID. Isn't it time for Minnesota to join the majority of other states? The majority they, of states have photo have, ID? 30 states do. 36 states. Well, um, this is how I understand our premier election system. It is not the case that the system exists where there's either like we're, we're against photo IDs or we're for photo IDs. It's actually more sophisticated than that. There are multiple ways that you can prove that you are who you say you are. That's what's so great about it. You can have a driver's license. You can have a student ID as long as it matches your residency. But you do have to prove that you are who you say you are. That, that is an essential component. And that is already in place. That's what, it's already in place. Whether you register 20 days ahead or even if you register on same day registration. It is not true that Minnesota willy nilly allows people to vote without proving who they are. It's just that there are multiple ways you can prove who you are and there are multiple ways that you can prove that you live where you say you live. And then the system puts in place cross checks so that we can also make sure you're eligible in other ways. And there are, there are, there are lots of, um, it has flexibility that meets the differences of all the, the huge breadth of Minnesotans, whether you live in rural Minnesota or you live in downtown Minneapolis or you're old or you're young or you're rich or you're poor. There is a pathway in for you, but it is not true that you do not have to prove who you say you are right now. You do. You do. Mr. McGrath, the fact that a majority of states have some sort of voter ID, should that have any impact on how we decide on it? Um, well, no, not necessarily, but I, I think it is indicative that people are starting to realize that it's time for us to update our antiquated election systems, many of which were designed well over 100 years ago. They were designed for smaller communities where people knew all their neighbors. You know, you'd know if a stranger showed up in town. You know, the city of Minneapolis, the, 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 the entire metro area is like two and a half million people. It's like half the population of the state lives in that one dense metro area. It's impossible for us to know our neighbors anymore. Identification is a fact of life because of the way we've chosen to live and because of the size of our population. We need identification for all kinds of things to prevent fraud, protect our own assets, and to protect our system against abuse. Uh, Mr. McGrath, you, uh, if voter ID passes, <laughs> first of all, I have, I, at first I, I misread that, so I thought, Nate asked, uh, if voter ID passes, how does my grand grandmother, who has expired, vote? But she, it says, actually, if voter ID passes, how does my grandmother, who has an expired ID, vote? Uh, <laughs> that makes more sense, but we do have 10,000 uh, deceased voters on the voter rolls right now in the state of Minnesota, uh, which is serious situation that we need to address. Uh, HAVA requires those voters to be removed from the voter rolls to prevent someone voting in the name of the, de of the deceased. Uh, after all, if you do vote in the name of the dead, who's going to come back and complain? Uh, but in this situation with the expired uh, identification, they're going to get a new identification that's not expired, that's going to be provided at no charge from the government. And if you're 65 or older, it's never going to expire again. That's current law. Uh, people that are senior citizens that aren't driving that get photo identification is valid for the rest of their life. Ms. Schranz, is Grandma with an expired ID going to have going to be able to vote? Well, we really want to make sure that Grandma votes. So um, I, it again, it depends on uh, how strict of an interpretation there is and how strict the enabling legislation is if we pass this. So the legislation that did pass in 2011 by the same legislature that put this amendment on the ballot would not have allowed for expired driver's licenses or state IDs. You would have had to have an ID that had the correct address on it and be up to, completely up to date. So again, the question is, we don't know. It depends on how the enabling legislation is written and what our priorities are in writing it and how bound in we are by the language in this particular amendment. 
And for the record, there is no evidence that Minnesotans are regularly posing as dead people and voting. Okay. Ms. Schranz, um, if you oppose voter idea, what should you do to com combat the serious danger of voter fraud? So here is the reality in Minnesota. The cases of actual ineligible voting that have been brought forward and prosecuted were people who voted ineligibly uh, because they still had their civil rights revoked because they had committed a felony. And there were 38, for example, of those people, um, pe people who ha were known to have voted um, ineligibly, sorry, in Hennepin County uh, in 2008. Photo identification would not solve that issue. Your driver's license or your state ID does not project to the world whether or not you've had your civil rights revoked. It's a good piece of identification for saying that you are who you say you are and for saying that you live, potentially that you live where you say you live and that you, you, you have an age, you have a birth so you're over 18, but it doesn't say anything about whether or not you're a citizen or whether or not you've had your civil rights revoked. So the proposal that's being put on the table here would not actually address the actual issue of ineligible voting that has unfolded. What would address it is a consistent daily cross-check between the databases of the voter rolls and the Department of Public Safety, which is now happening since 2010 on a daily basis. Then certain people who may have their uh, civil rights have, it, have been revoked, they could be flagged, they could be challenged at the polls. These are the kinds of ways that we actually need to solve problems, is look at the system as it is and figure out how are the, what are the smartest ways that we can make sure that we cross check, we do it regularly, we do it often and the system is tight. But it has, again, it, it has very little to do with the question of whether or not people have a particular piece of photo identification. That will not solve the problems of ineligible voting. Mr. McGrath. We have spent a fair amount of time tonight talking about substantially equivalent eligibility verification. Uh, the Constitutional Amendment clearly does address this problem, as well as many others, and it equalizes the process that she, uh, Ms. Schrantz is describing that is done behind the scenes for advance registrants, for election day registrants, because none of that works right now for election day registration. There is no eligibility verification. We take your word for it. Uh, so the amendment does. I mean, it just plainly, clearly does address eligibility. We've spent 20 minutes at least talking about it today. Uh, Mr. McGrath, I believe you, you mentioned that if we did have the uh, voter ID requirement, we would not need vouching, it would disappear. Uh, is that a good thing? Well, I, I think that our current vouching process is ridiculous. Uh, Canada, our neighbors to the north, they require photo ID to vote, but they do have an exception. They actually have vouching in Canada's election system. But the Canadian system allows people to vouch for one individual, not 15 like Minnesota's does. By the way, when our vouching system was first established, it was unlimited. And at some point, the legislature around the 1980s said, eh, maybe unlimited's a bit much. So they reduced it to 30. And then later on, they went, eh, two vanfuls of people to vouch for. Maybe that's too much. And they cut it down to 15. And that's, you know, the great compromise that we've got. Uh, Canada's system of one, maybe I could live with that. But interestingly, the voter ID amendment does not necessarily do away with vouching. It does away with vouching as a means of identification, but for verifying your residence, there's nothing in the amendment that would preclude that. Okay. Ms. Schrantz, do you want to talk about vouching? Uh, vouching is a, as I said before, it's a simple and legal process in which a person who knows somebody, uh, who, a person who is a registered voter, who lives in the same precinct, as somebody else can then uh, sign an oath uh, in front of an election judge and say, I establish that this person is who they say they are. Um, again, 83% of vouching that actually happens in Minnesota is people who live at the same address. 
So that, that is most of the vouching that is going on. And most people are not vouching for 15 people. It's a mom who vouches for her son. It's somebody uh, who's having a hard time and is living with you and is your roommate and you vouch for them. It's someone who just moved to Minnesota and they haven't yet got their utility bill. That's what vouching is. I, I, it, it does not pose a serious threat uh, to the integrity of our election system. And yes, we do check eligibility um, of people after they vote. That is true. You do, part of the responsibility of voting in Minnesota is that you are responsible when you go vote to say, to establish, sign an oath <clears throat> that you are a citizen and you have not had your civil rights revoked. But then it's checked to see if you told the truth. Uh, we've got another question from the audience about how exactly would absentee voters uh, show a voter ID? Uh, Ms. Schranz? I don't know. I don't know how an absentee voter would show a photo ID. That, that's the problem. Mr. McGrath? Uh, they wouldn't, uh, obviously. The, uh, the amendment is written to separate in-person voting who are required to show photo ID from not in-person voting, which is in the next paragraph, who have to do something that has a substantially equivalent effect. In other words, if you're voting absentee ballot, the government has to be able to verify that you are who you say you are and that you're eligible to vote, but it doesn't require an identical process. The word substantially equivalent does not mean identical process. It means as close as we can get to the same outcome. Uh, so you'll write your ID number on the uh, signature envelope or you'll show your identification to the witness that certifies your ballot or something like that. Uh, Mr. McGrath, uh, if, if this were to pass, Minnesota would be one of two states, the other being Mississippi, that has this constitu constitutional provision. Do we really need this in the Constitution? Couldn't we do it legislatively? Well, there was a bill that I thought was pretty comprehensive passed in 2011. It was supported by the overwhelming majority of Minnesotans at the time the Star Tribune poll showed 80% public support. The will of the people was thwarted by Governor Dayton when he vetoed the bill. Uh, the, the Constitution is in many ways the people's document, and it is the people instructing their government how it is going to operate. So I think this is entirely appropriate that the people will tell the legislators the terms under which they, they will be elected. It's our process. We're taking charge of it. Ms. Schrond, should the people be able to tell the legislature how we vote? Well, I have you have to ask the question again. Yeah, well, the question is about should we put this in the Constitution? I don't think so. I don't think it belongs in the Constitution. I think that if we, if we are going to make a decision that is as profound as the decision that this is, that would significantly alter how we do our elections in Minnesota, then it should go through a hard, rough and tumble political process where the people actually get to hold their public officials accountable. And it might take a little more time, but we're much more likely to get it right. Okay. We are getting close to the time to wrap it up, but... Uh... Before we go to closing statements, uh, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's debate was made possible through the financial support of the Otto Bremer Foundation, the Prairie Island Indian Community, and the Target Corporation. We'd like to thank Metropolitan State University and the Minnesota State University Student Association for co-hosting co this debate with uh, Debate Minnesota tonight. And special thanks to Minnesota Public Radio for recording tonight's debate, to Uptake for live streaming it, and to all my colleagues uh, from television, radio, and print media, as well as you bloggers and tweeters in the audience. Uh, most importantly, we want to thank all of you for coming, and to those of you at home for listening or, or watching. And now for our closing statements, uh, we're going to start again with Ms. Schranz. Our premier election system works. It's a sophisticated system that safeguards the integrity of our elections and draws in every eligible voter where everyone plays by the rules. I just don't recognize the Minnesota that Mr. McGrath describes. Here is the Minnesota that I see, and it's the secret of our success. You're serving our country in Afghanistan. 
you can self-certify. Your word is good enough for us. And thank you for your service. You live on a farm or in our great north woods. You can mail in your ballot because we really need to hear your voice. You're in your 80s and you have voted in every election. We know you. We'll make the system work for you. You lost your home in this economy and you've moved in with me. Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna go with you and I'm gonna stand by your side and I'm gonna sign my name in front of God and this government and everybody that I know who you are. And today you are a Minnesota voter. This is who we are. This is Minnesota. But this amendment, it's just not going to work for us because it's not who we are. So Minnesotans, please, just vote no. Mr. McGrath, your closing statement. If men were the angels that Ms. Schrantz and some others that opposed the voter ID amendment seem to think that we are. We wouldn't even need elections because we would not need a government. <laughs> we would just govern ourselves peaceably. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is there are some bad actors out there in the world, obviously. Stealing a car is a felony. Voter fraud is a felony. We protect our cars with ignition keys and locks. We don't just put a notice on the door that says warning stealing this car is a felony and then hope for the best. We, we take steps to prevent that theft. We don't do the same thing with our election system. And with what's at stake with our federal budget in the trillions of dollars, with trillions of taxpayer dollars on the line, you can't believe that people wouldn't be tempted to steal ballots, to win that political power and control of all that money, and at the same time lock up your huffy uh, to the post because you think somebody might steal your bicycle. It's not worth much compared to your ballot. I think that uh, the expense that we've discussed, even if it gets to the highest possible estimates of $50 million to implement voter ID, is well worth it for confidence in a system that holds our entire republic together. Uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. And that ends tonight's debate. Uh, thank you all, and good night.